This podcast is supported exclusively by listeners like you who have become patrons. Currently, 294 people like yourself have signed up to the benefits of becoming a patron, such as extra podcasts, episode guides, and much more. I'm three quarters of the way towards my goal of $2,000, which will help me really expand the show. With your support, we can reach this over the summer months. So sign up today at patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast. That's patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast. In each show, I thank patrons without whose support this show would not be possible. So this week, I want to shout out to Kylie, John O'Leary, Gregory Heidelberger, Peter Myers, David O'Rourke, Rita, Thomas Swords, Thomas O'Higgins, Wayne McGuire, John Slattery, and Timothy Troy. Hello and welcome to the Irish History Podcast. My name is Finn DeWire and this is History vs. Reality, Daily Life in the 1840s. This episode is something of an extra in the series before I get back into the story of the Great Famine next week. The next podcast is going to be pretty heavy, one of the darkest I've made. I was even mulling over whether to make it or not, but it is an integral part of the story, so it's currently in production. Anyway, that needs another week at least, and I wanted to get something out before then. This topic has been at the back of my mind more or less since I started the whole series, and I think this is as good a time as any to introduce it, because it doesn't fit into any one part of the series, but it is important all the same. If you've listened to past episodes in the series, you will know I rely heavily on the words of visitors to Ireland to try and capture what rural life was like during the 1840s. However, there are major problems using these accounts. As we will see, their writers were very biased. In many ways, they can only create the outlines or contours of the picture of what life was like in the mid-19th century. In this podcast, I attempt to colour in these outlines. To do this, I have interviewed two archaeologists, Eve Campbell from the Ackle Archaeological Field School, who those of you who have signed up to Patreon will have heard on podcasts there, and Frank Miles. Before I play the interviews with Frank and Eve, I begin by looking at some of the accounts written by visitors in the 19th century, what they tell us, and what the problems with them are. While the west of Ireland today is a pretty popular holiday destination, it was only the more intrepid of visitors that pushed into the far west in the 19th century. Strange as it may sound, parts of the west, even then, were considered by outsiders to be one of the last frontiers of Europe. To many people, western Mayo, for example, was a strange and mysterious land inhabited by volatile and potentially dangerous people. When Harriet Martineau embarked on a journey to Belmullis in the summer of 1852, she had this to say in a letter she wrote to a friend. We passed through the districts of the English settlers. We have skirted the lonely Kylemore Loch and crossed the moorlands at its head. We have travelled the length of the wild killeries, where it was scarcely possible to believe ourselves within the bounds of our own empire. We have left Connemara behind us and penetrated way into Mayo. We are now about to plunge into the very wildest part of the island, beyond Ackle, to the Mullet. These are the words you might expect to read in an account from someone like David Livingstone, who at the same time as Martineau was in the west of Ireland, was venturing up the Zambezi River. While Bell Mullet and the Zambezi are thousands of miles apart, in the eyes of people like Harriet Martineau and other visitors to the west of Ireland in the 1840s and 1850s, they were closer than you might expect. Most of the continent of modern Africa and parts of the west of Ireland were viewed in a very similar manner, a deeply racist vision of the world. The west of Ireland and most of Africa were regarded as wild, uncivilised and barbaric, the inhabitants of both places subhuman. Ludicrous as this racist view of the world was, it heavily shaped how people viewed Ireland and more importantly it informed many of the accounts that historians rely on today to fill in what were large gaps in our understanding of rural Irish society in the 19th century. Initially, accounts like those of Harriet Martineau, who I quoted earlier, do seem pretty reliable. There's a uniformity across them that seem too similar to be contrived. What dissenting voices there are can be written off as exceptions that prove the rule. 
they all, to one degree or another, present a pretty one-dimensional view of life in the west of Ireland, where people were born, lived and died in what was grinding poverty, and, if these accounts are to be believed, didn't do very much else. However, when we look deeper, there are reasons why all these accounts are similar, and it's not necessarily because they present an accurate view of society. The visitors to 19th century Ireland tended, by and large, to share a similar set of experiences, outlooks on the world and a uniformity in prejudices and biases, and it was this that led them to write accounts that are not entirely correct, but that are all very similar. So to understand these accounts, I want to explain a bit about the people who wrote them, how they travelled and how this shaped what they left in their written records. Any traveller to rural Ireland in the 19th century, like any traveller in the 21st century, was never going to have a complete understanding of the society they saw. They were only passing through, often only spending a few days in one place. By their very nature, travellers only get a snapshot then, from which they develop a general view of society based on their own preconceived ideas. As we have seen, most if not all visitors coming to Ireland were racist to one degree or another, and this influenced their accounts. Furthermore, these travellers tended to hit the road in the summer months. This was not by choice, but a decision forced on them. To undertake an extensive journey through the west of Ireland in winter faced major obstacles. When a man whose accounts I have used in the series, Caesar Otway, travelled to the northwestern corner of County Mayo in the 1830s and 1840s, there was scarcely any roads worth mentioning. He even struggled to cross bogs on horseback in summer. Winter rain made a journey like this very difficult, if not completely impossible. Now, by visiting Ireland in the summer months, these travellers arrived at a very specific time, one when food was scarce. In the Western world in the 21st century, the time of the year has little bearing on our food supply. You don't ever walk down to the supermarket wondering whether there'll be shortages of food. However, in 19th century rural Ireland, the situation was very different. Most people survived on what they produced themselves or what was produced in their immediate locality. Frequently, supplies of food did run short in rural Ireland in the summer months as one harvest approached and the supplies from the previous year had been depleted. Given their limited understanding of Irish society, many failed to realise that these shortages were temporary rather than a constant feature of life. Had they arrived, for example, in late November rather than in the summer when the harvest had been brought in, they would have found a very different society. Now this is not to say that the opinions of travellers in the 19th century are completely wrong. They are without doubt an invaluable snapshot of life, but they are not in general a complete picture. Now the best example I can give you of this is in relation to housing. Nearly every visitor to Ireland in the 19th century commented on the standard of rural housing and they almost universally use this as evidence of widespread poverty across the island. I've covered some of these accounts in earlier shows. There is no doubt that 19th century houses in Ireland were tiny and uncomfortable by modern standards or even contemporary standards in England. However, we need to be careful when we use this as an example of widespread poverty in society. Now, it's important to say that most people who lived in these houses were poor, but the houses themselves are not a good measure of how widespread poverty was. The experience and words of a man called Patrick Knight illustrate this really well in what's a really fascinating story. Patrick Knight was a pretty unusual writer in that he was originally from Castle Bar, a town in County Mayo, and spent a lot of time in rural Mayo as he worked on the plans for the town of Belmullet, which was only built in the early 19th century. In his 1830s account of Irish, the remote northwestern corner of Mayo, he revealed a fascinating account of houses. He started with a general description that is very similar to most other writings from the mid-19th century. Here he's talking about the peasantry. In their houses, there is little of cleanliness or apparent comforture, bedding or the usual accompaniment of a certain sum of riches. The whole thought seems to be the rearing and tending of cattle, going to fairs or exchanging. Knight then develops the idea that houses are not necessarily a measure of wealth because people have different priorities. He goes on to tell this story. In 1813, I slept at a man's house who had 100 black cattle and 200 sheep and there was not a single chair or stool in his house but a three-legged one. No bed but rushes, no vessel for boiling their meals but one. Yet 
this man was said to be very rich besides the stock named above. The words of Patrick Knight hint that Irish society had very different priorities from, say, life in England or even the east of Ireland, and that because someone lived in what we would regard as a run-down house did not necessarily reflect their overall wealth. This lack of understanding of outside visitors has led to many misconceptions around housing in 19th century Ireland, but it also illustrates the general limitations of historical accounts. However, even people like Patrick Knight, who seems to have had a good understanding of society in rural Ireland, did not present a full picture. We need a more nuanced view. Overall, relying on the words of visitors, no matter who they are, can only offer us an incomplete picture. We need to look further, and this is where archaeology comes in. So, to try and expand our view of life in rural Ireland, I've interviewed two archaeologists, Frank Miles, who's based in Dublin, and Eve Campbell from the Ackle Field School, who's currently excavating the remains of houses at Keen Bay. They both offered unique insights into the life of poor people in rural and urban Ireland, often using tiny fragments of what they have left behind. And they both created a really vibrant picture of how our ancestors lived. I began with Frank, asking him to introduce himself and what he works at. OK, my name is Frank Miles. I'm an archaeologist. Um, I, uh, I suppose I have a small practice called Archaeology and Built Heritage, which is based in Smithfield on the north side of Dublin. Um, I'm, most of the stuff I probably look at is, would be considered quite late in terms of, you know, in terms of archaeology. I'm very interested in the, the post-medieval period extending right up into the modern period. So I've actually done work on the archaeology of the 1916 rebellion, for example. I'm also very interested in um, West Coast monasticism in the, the early Christian period. So the, er, the period of about 700 1000 um, AD, uh, specifically on islands off the West Coast. So occasionally I'm able to sort of uh, do both, as in the case of Inish Shark of Galway, where we're looking at early Christian archaeology and the archaeology of those people who lived on the island, um, really until the island was um, was um, evacuated in 1960. I went on to ask Frank about the limitations of historical sources and quickly he began to flesh out a picture of life in the west of Ireland being far less remote than we might expect and also how the houses are not necessarily as spartan as some accounts suggest. He begins, though, by talking about the limitations of literary sources. There are a couple of things there. I mean, in, in terms of class consciousness, if you look at even in contemporary literature and perceptions of working class life, um, we, know, we know they're not correct even today. So how the hell can they be correct? You know, in, 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 the, in the 19th century, it's much more nuanced. The, the, the commentators in the 19th century, um, some of whom actually would have gone and would have, would have entered the cabins of the poor, etc., etc., mm. etc. Um, but I think there's a tendency to paint a very simplified picture, as you said, of crushing poverty, especially in congested districts in the West Coast. In terms of what archaeologists do, we look, we look for material culture and um, things from the ground and we analyse them. And, um, you know, in, in terms of the material culture of the famine, um, it's interesting, I think, that when you look at the small islands off the west coast, you're getting the same imported English pottery that you're seeing in, in Dublin in the same period. There doesn't appear to be any shortage of pottery. Um, of course, we've other questions regarding how did that pottery get there? Yeah. How was it? You know, how was it transported? Even where where was it made? But in terms of the end user, the end user, they have ceramics. They're yeah. they're, they're not completely without things as such. Now, Frank's reference to class consciousness reminded me of something Eve Campbell from the Ackle Field School mentioned when I interviewed her last week at Keen Bay on Ackle Island. She touched on a similar theme, pointing out how visitors to Ackle did not understand the world they encountered there. She's talking about the shape of the houses in this clip. Um, you'll notice uh, how the corners are slightly rounded and that was something a lot of contemporaries who came to visit Ackle commented on. Some of them even suggested the people in Ackle didn't have the technology to make corners, which is really crazy. It was uh, an adaptation to the, to the environmental conditions, the wind being a really big one here. She then pointed out how visitors who presented accounts of these houses as backward 
were completely incorrect. Yeah, the west coast of Ireland and the island, islands in Mayo like Ackle have ferocious winter winters. I've been here in January and you can barely stand up with the wind sometime. So I think a lot of the vernacular building traditions are really trying to um, adapt the buildings to those local conditions. Um, so the rounded corners is very much because people didn't have gables in their houses in these kind of buildings. They would have had a small kind of low inset roof that was kind of tied down or weighted down with stones to to try and uh, avoid the roof essentially being blown off by the wind. But also people didn't have chimneys in these in houses at this time, so there was no need to have a structure that would support the chimney. Well, houses provide lots of information. Frank went on to highlight how what often seems like discarded rubbish reveals so much about our ancestors. The, 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 there's, there's one artefact that's very useful um, to archaeologists um, looking at this sort of stuff, and that's the clay pipe. A clay pipe is a clay smoking pipe. You hear them called dudines and uh, made out of white kaolin, um, mass-produced in presses and originally sold with tobacco in, actually in them, so you'd buy them with tobacco. So they might be used once or twice and then broken and discarded. I was pretty astounded by what Frank was able to tell from these pipes and the intriguing insights he could give to the lives of ordinary people. This is the type of information visitors to 19th century Ireland did not record, but it adds a colour to life, often lacking in historical sources. So when you look at clay pipes in, in, in Dublin, let, let's just say from the early 19th century, um, a couple of things emerge. Um, there is a propensity in Dublin to actually smoke counterfeit clay pipes. And that might sound a bit strange, but if you look at, I would say, between 30 and 40% of the clay pipes that you would excavate in Dublin from the, the early 19th century, ostensibly appear to come from um, Rauda in Holland. Mm. And this is because they have a stamp on them. It's, it's, it's an, a stamp of an, a capital L with a crown over it, which is the sign of the town of Rauda. Um, it's a bit like those um, those headphones that kids used to have a couple of years ago, the, um, the Dre headphones. Yeah, 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 um, yeah. And they weren't Dr. Dre headphones at all. So th- these pipes were actually manufactured in Dublin. They were manufactured in Francis Street, but they used the stamp of Rauda to make them appear to be a little bit more sophisticated. Mm. Um, so this, this gives the smoker a certain amount of agency. He's not he's not smoking a double pipe. He's smoking a pipe that looks as if it may have come from Holland, and so that gives him a sort of a, a veneer of sophistication. I think these pipes also offer pretty cool insights into the political opinions of people at the time. As you go further into the century, you discover that um, clay pipes become significant politically because the manufacturers start to start to make clay pipes with, and they use political stamps on them. Um, the one I'm very interested in, in repeal stamps because of what's happening at the moment, where you have the you know the uh, the repeal campaign at the moment against the Eighth Amendment, and one of the one of the things that was produced. To, you know, in support of that was the repeal sweatshirt. That's exactly like what, what was happening in the 1840s, the 1830s and the 1840s, where they were producing clay pipes that said repeal. They repealed the Act of Union. So by smoking the clay pipe, by wearing the repeal shirt, you're, you know, you're, you're voicing a political uh, opinion. Um, later on in the century then, you know, the, the, the pipes become much more nationalistic. Um, you have things like Aaron Gabra. So, um, you know, smoke, smoking a clay pipe, smoking a, play, a clay pipe to a certain extent, you have money to afford tobacco. Um, it's also, you know, you're demonstrating something of yourself. I'm not saying that everybody who smoked a repeal clay pipe agreed with the repeal of the Act of Union, yeah. but it's significant that there are a lot of them out there. Frank then went on to talk about the most common of archaeological finds, shards of pottery. When I worked in archaeology around a decade ago, you literally found dozens of pieces of pottery every day. Frank in this clip uses what seems to be little more than broken pieces of delf to reconstruct a picture of life in remote cabins in the 19th century. This picture is not what you might expect. People use cups, saucers, milk jugs, and it indicates that the remote west of Ireland is not as isolated as historical accounts from the time would indicate. I mean, if you know, on 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 Ackle Island, I mean, um, excavations on Ackle have have had very similar results to my excavations on Inishark. Um, 
where you're getting, you know, mass produced uh, English teawares. And I'm talking, I'm talking cups and saucers. And this is very sort of, to my mind, what to my mind is very, you know, genteel. Yeah. You know, yeah, s- yeah. S- sipping your tea out of a cup and a saucer. We don't have cups and saucers in our house. Sugar bowls. Yeah. <laughs> you know, sugar bowls. I mean, milk jugs. Um, I think we have one milk jug in our house, um, but I don't think it has a handle. <laughs> so in a way, you have to think around it and you, ha- you have to look at it in, the, in the context of a sort of early globalization. Um, you know, people, it, it becomes very cheap to manufacture, to mass manufacture ceramics in Staffordshire. So they have to sell them. So what do they do? They, 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 they sell them. They, 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 the, the whole system develops where you have like wholesalers, retailers. Um, I have my own personal pet theory about a certain type of pottery called spongeware, which I think is coming in from Scotland, not by pottery dealers. I think people, tatey ogres, people from, you know, from, I suppose, Ackle, the, the north, the northwestern seaboard are going to Scotland on a seasonal basis for the, um, from the, you know, for, from, from the post famine period onwards. And I think they're literally bringing back ceramics. They might bring back one bowl to put it's on really the family dresser. You know yeah. what I mean? But, but, but and we're getting the evidence of this. So this is a particular type of ceramic, which is, which is, um, uh, made mostly in Scotland. But, um, I think, I think we're seeing that. So we're, what we're seeing is effectively people, you know, people going away to work. To bring back money, which is very cash, mm. which they don't get in their own economy, yeah. um, but they're they're coming back from Scotland to their homes in the west coast, and they're bringing back um, a nice, almost like a souvenir, colourful okay. colourful bowl for their mummy or something. You know, <laughs> and I mean, the, the, this is giving them agency. Even when, when when you look at how these networks are supposed to develop, um, you're starting to see a, a sense of the sort of the, the modern modern shop system. You know. And um, these are things that have to be cons- d- 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 these are all things that have to be considered. You know, um, you can't consider everything in isolation. Everything works within a network, and we're all interconnected. It's it's a much 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 more complicated story than 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 initially appears. This was something Eve was also keen to highlight as well. So these people, while they lived in a single uh, room dwelling with their cows, with with all their family, with no chimney, all huddled around the fire, they were really into their nice ceramics. So they had, they had these beautiful glazed uh, plates that came over from um, the pottery district. They had lovely colours, blues and reds and browns, the kind of stuff my mum has on her dresser today. Even though pretty brief, I hope these interviews have given you a greater sense of what life might have been like in the 19th century. Through previous episodes, I may have focused too heavily on the writing of contemporary travellers, which, while useful, do have their limitations. I want to thank Frank and Eve for their time in giving these interviews as well. If you want to hear more, there's a full interview with Eve currently on Patreon now. I'll also be uploading the full content of that interview with Frank over the weekend. You can get those by becoming a patron today by subscribing at patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast. That's patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast. Finally, before I go, I would like to hear what you guys think of including the occasional interview in these podcasts. If it's something you like, I will do more of them. So let me know at info at irishhistorypodcast.ie. That's info at irishhistorypodcast.ie. Until next time. Slaughter.